We haven't yet talked about the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to do that on Thursday. I teach a whole class on Luke and Acts, and most of you have taken the course Luke-Acts, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Luke, one class period. But I'll try and treat Luke-Acts in a way that maybe you haven't had it um, presented before. So it will be new to you uh, in some ways, and uh, it will make a contribution to this class. One of the things that Luke does, that Matthew didn't, is write a second volume. Luke wrote a story of the life of Jesus. He's also the only early Christian who went on to write a story of the early church. I'm glad that he did. Otherwise, um, uh, we wouldn't have a lot of the information about the, uh, the um, early missionary activity of Paul and the others. <clears throat> but what, what it did was it gave Luke an opportunity to talk at length about the Gentile mission. One of the issues in the early church, and it, it was spawned by Jesus, he had a lot to do with this, okay? I have told you before that Jesus never talked to a Gentile. That was a gross overstatement of the case. Maybe not overstatement. That was maybe a misleading statement of the case. What is true is that even though Jesus had very little to do with a Gentile mission, he had everything to do with the Gentile mission. Luke spends his whole second volume on the subject. It was one of the biggest issues in the early church. You know, we have issues today. I don't know, depending on what denomination you're from, you have issues that you deal with in your church. I can think back on my life as a Christian and the different issues that I have dealt with at different periods of time, from baptism to predestination to um, to um, the authority of Scripture, to inerrancy, to all kinds of things that, that I have dealt with. <clears throat> there were two huge issues in the first century for the early church. One was the Gentile mission. What about the Gentiles? You see, this movement started out in a, a, Jew, a Jewish milieu in the Jewish world. All the early Christians were Jews. All the followers of Jesus were Jews. The questions began to, to be asked once the Gentiles began to be included. And that's why Paul is sort of like a storm center of controversy in the first century and in the book of Acts and in his letters. A storm center. He's in the middle of a hurricane. And the hurricane is this question. What about the Gentiles? So you decide to include the Gentiles into the new religious sect. The followers of Jesus. The Christians. If you decide to include them, what are the parameters of their inclusion? What are the conditions of their participation? Because this is a Jewish sect. These guys went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They still circumcised their children. They still went to the temple. You see, for the early Christians, the the early Jewish Christians, the way that they followed Moses was by following Jesus. So for a church like Matthew, you could say that they're religious practice was Moses with Jesus or Moses through Jesus and that's the way Jesus is presented in the Gospel of Matthew 
He is the authoritative interpreter of Moses. In the second century, there's a guy that's going to come along. His name is Marcion. He said this. <coughs> this was his Christianity. Jesus without Moses. In fact, you know, Marcion excluded the Hebrew Scriptures from his canon of Holy Scripture. In fact, he only included a small percentage of the apostolic documents. He liked Paul, and he liked the Gospel of Luke. But he edited the Gospel of Luke pretty extensively before he accepted it. He was careful to peel away everything that had anything to do with the Old Testament. In fact, it was Marcion who probably motivated the early church to formalize its canon, New Testament canon. What is included, what is excluded. Marcion was the, really the first one to take daring steps in that direction. And most Christians were so unhappy with the way he was doing it that their response was what we ended up with, uh, you know, the formation of the New Testament. By the end of the second century, we have lists of New Testament books that are very close to the list of books in the New Testament that we have right now. So Marcion, Marcion said, Jesus without Moses. <coughs> he liked Paul, which is a curious thing because, you know, Paul was a Jew. He was a Pharisee, converted Pharisee. But he was also the, the missionary to the Gentiles. So Paul really was involved in all of this controversy clear back in the 50s and the 60s. He, he, he probably spearheaded he probably spearheaded it. In fact, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, where Paul Paul made it necessary for all of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem to get together and decide, what are we going to require of these Gentiles? Do they have to be circumcised or not? All these things they had to decide on. And that was one of the things that inevitably happens when your religion, when your body of spiritual truth steps outside of your culture and into another culture. And I want to talk about that before we end today. About how, how do we take a religion like, as we practice it and take it to another culture where they live differently than we do. When I was working on my dissertation, or my PhD, in uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, areas that I spent a lot of time developing uh, um, an ability to teach college courses was in Native American religions. I spent a lot of time in Native American religions. Because, you know, I'm from North America, I figured these guys deserve um, to be heard. And, and uh, so in my comparative religions class, I even have a, a section that I spend on Native American religions. Fascinating, the religions of, of North Americans, natives. Um, but you know, when the early church started to um, engage in missions to the uh, Native Americans, they did a whole lot of weird things. They made Native Americans cut their hair, dress differently, change the language they speak, change the foods they eat, all these things. We were making them Christians. Or were we? 
I don't know if Paul ate the food I ate, or spoke the language I do, or wore the clothes that I do, or had hair like mine. So why do we turn, why do, what is involved in stepping across into another culture? One of the decisions you have to deal with, struggle with, is what is spiritual truth and what is cultural baggage? When you step across the line, you've got to learn to let the baggage go. And that's what the early church struggled with. That's what we see them struggling with in the Gentile mission. What is spiritual truth or what is just cultural baggage? There were really... Um, anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. So the real uh, live issue in the early church was the Gentiles and the, the Jews. This... Um, this difference between them. And I can illustrate this for you, okay? I want you to get your New Testaments out. We're going to look at three passages. Matthew 10, 5. Then we'll look at chapter 21, 43. Then we'll look at 28, 19. Okay? The first one, Matthew 10, 5. This is uh, the missionary journey that uh, Jesus sent the twelve out on, and this is what he told them. The twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, and he said, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there we've got clear instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go only to Israel. Interesting. Look at this passage, 2143. In chapter 21, verse 43, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. That's curious. Go only to Israel. Then we've got this warning. The kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to another nation that will produce its fruit. Then finally, in chapter 28, verse 19, we have Jesus commissioning his disciples. And he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Do you see how this has changed? Right within the right within the text of Matthew. We have the beginnings of the Gentile mission right inside Matthew. In many ways, Matthew does the same thing as Luke without writing the book of Acts. He, he shows you within the gospel, within the 28 chapters of his gospel, how this movement is going to go out into the whole world without actually showing you how it happened. He's going to show you that it's, that's where it's headed. But this is a curious sort of tension. Because Jesus at one point says, don't go to the Gentiles. The next minute he says, go to the Gentiles. 
I can illustrate this movement within the life of Jesus in another way, okay? Do you remember when we were talking about the sources that Matthew and Luke and Mark, Matthew and Luke used, Matthew and Luke used Mark. They also used another source that I called Q. Q is a collection of about 250 verses that Matthew and Luke have in common. And scholars, including myself, think that Q actually represents a, a text in antiquity that had its own life. And it perished in antiquity only to be um, salvaged or preserved inside Matthew and Luke. But if you take all of the Q stuff, this is what you see. I want to show you some things that occur in Q. And by the way, when, when I say Q 3 verse 8, I'm really referring to Luke 3 verse 8 with the Q um, sigla because scholars have used Luke's in, uh, um, versification to refer to the, the Q text, primarily because Luke preserves the original order of Q, we think, better than Matthew did. Matthew has a different way of mixing up his sources than, um, than Luke. So in Q chapter 3, verse 8, look at what this passage says. These are all warning passages, by the way. And the first warning occurs in the ministry of John the Baptist. It's in Luke chapter 3, verse 8. John says, Therefore bring forth fruits in keeping with your repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able from these rocks to raise up children to Abraham. So we've got the prophet John going to Israel and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if people come to him with no repentance, no sincere repentance, he says, go home. This isn't, this isn't, a, this isn't a call to the nation Israel as a whole. This is a call to those within the nation Israel who will repent, okay? He says, if you don't repent, don't even think for a minute that you would be included just because you're a child of Abraham, because God can raise up children from these rocks to Abraham. Rocks, these dead, inanimate things. In fact, by the time we get into the early church, God does do just that. He raises up children of Abraham from rocks. You and me, Gentiles, dead, inanimate, unclean human beings. So what, Luke, what John the Baptist says God can do, he does. He does. The next passage is from Q chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. This is a story, this is a story of a healing in, in, uh, in um, Q. It's also found, of course, in Matthew and Luke. And here's how it goes. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a certain centurion's slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly entreated him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. Now remember, guys, this centurion is a Gentile. At least in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus doesn't even talk to a Gentile. Well, until the end, when he talks to Pilate, the only Gentile that Jesus talks to in Luke is Pilate at his trial, and he's bound by law to answer him. 
But here, he's asked by some of fellow Jews to heal this centurion slave. And they say, you know, this guy is, he's cool. He's worthy for you to do this. Why is he worthy? Because he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. This guy liked the Jews. He was very partial to them and their religion. In fact, he built them their worship place, their synagogue. Now, Jesus started on his way with them. When he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, said to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further. I am not fit for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Just say the word, my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, and I have soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to another one, come, and he comes. To my slave, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. And he turned and said to the multitude, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. He sent them back. They got, they got back to the house and found the slave healed. So Jesus heals him from a distance. Why? Because of a Gentile's faith. So, Here the Gentiles are rocks. Here the Gentiles have faith. Look at chapter 10, verse 13 through 16. <coughs> Start in verse 10. Whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, two Gentile cities, Tyre and Sidon are Gentile cities, Chorazin and Bethsaida are both Jewish Galilean villages where Jesus ministered. He said, if the miracles performed in you were performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. Here he's comparing these villages where he's ministering and being rejected to Gentile cities. They would listen. They would, they would listen. You know, in Q, like Luke, Jesus never goes to the Gentiles. He never goes there. He never really engages in a mission to them. He just threatens Israel with the possibility. <coughs> the next one is... Um, Chapter 11, verses 31 and 32. He says, The queen of the south shall rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This is cool because Jesus uses the queen of the south. You guys know who she is? The queen of Sheba. She's referring to uh, an event in the 
in the uh, life of Solomon, where the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, came to witness the wisdom of Solomon and marvel at him. So he says, you know what? The queen of the south is going to rise up against this generation because she came and marveled at Solomon. And something greater than Solomon is here. Then he uses another example. Ninevites, they'll stand up at the judgment and condemn this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. The Ninevites were the Assyrians. The, the city of Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. You know the Assyrians. They were the ones who destroyed the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. They were vicious in, in battle. They were enemies of Israel. But they responded to Jonah. Then he says, something greater than Jonah is here. These passages are also warnings. The queen and Nineveh. <coughs> Q is filled with warnings. In fact, we have warnings outside of Q in the Gospel of Luke. Look at, look at this, chapter 4. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth. <clears throat> he says, verse 25, Luke 4, I say to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months and a great famine came over the land. And yet, Elijah was sent to none of them. but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Who is this woman? Well, she was a Gentile. So all these widows existed in Israel, but none of them benefited from Elijah, only this Gentile widow. And Jesus is out uh, appealing to the people in his hometown, and he says, you know what? It's going to be like that again. It's going to be like that again. God is going to send a prophet to his people and no one but the Gentiles will benefit from him. This ended up happening because these warnings become in the Gospel of Matthew in its final edition. Um, let's say that Q represents Matthew, the first version and that the Matthew, the text of Matthew that we have is Matthew edition number two. In Matthew edition number two, we have no more warnings. The kingdom of God has exploded onto the world outside of the borders of Israel. And we can, talk, we can look at some of the parables in Matthew and see this. The, the parables that he told about the kingdom of God being like a seed that grows secretly and all of a sudden you're going to see the fruit of it and it's going to, be, it's going to amaze you how far the fruit of the seed has spread. But it doesn't change the fact, guys, that what we have in Matthew is a gospel that was used by Jewish Christians who were at the edge of the Gentile mission. They were learning how to cope with it, how to live with it. And to illustrate that, I want to show you a little bit about Peter. In the early church, we have Paul on one extreme, who is the missionary to the, to the Gentiles. We have James, who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, at the other end. 
there was a lot of tension between Paul and James. Because there was a lot of opposition and suspicion about Paul. The person that wound up sort of being in the center of these two extremes was Peter. Peter was known in the early church as sort of a peacemaker, a bridge builder. And it's interesting to see the place that Peter has in the Gospel of Matthew. In the Gospel of Matthew, for example, chapter 14, verse 28 through 31, Peter is the only disciple who walks on water. In chapter 16, verses 16 through 19, Peter is the one who makes this confession of who Jesus is. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says in response to him, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you? This was a revelation, Peter. You received a revelation of insight into who I am. And then he blessed him and gave him a promise. You guys remember that? Chapter 16. <coughs> and I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is all addressed to Peter, the individual, to whom this revelation was given, then the blessing, then the promise. The keys to the kingdom were held by this person, Simon Bar Jonah, whose name was changed to Peter. Petros in Greek, which means rock or Cephas in Aramaic, which means rock. Paul frequently refers to him as Cephas. That was his new name, the rock. Then in chapter 17, verses 24 to 27, there's a question about the temple tax. The um, Jewish, uh, the, the um, the leaders from the Jewish synagogue come and ask Peter about their payment of the temple tax. Peter goes and talks to Jesus, and Jesus says, um, go catch a fish. When, when you get, catch the fish, open its mouth, there will be a coin in it, and that coin will pay the temple tax for me and you. Just me and you. Peter gets a tax relief but the other disciples don't. All these things suggest that in Matthew, Peter had a pretty significant place. And I think it's possible for us to suggest, maybe not boldly, but suggest that Matthew is a gospel where Peter had a lot of authority. It was a gospel used by a church where Peter had a lot of authority a lot of clout. He was a leader. He's given preeminence in the document. And one of the things about Peter is that he became a bridge, a, a peaceful bridge between James and Paul. We see this in, in the Gospel of Matthew. I have read a lot of commentaries that, that portray Matthew as sort of this anti-Pauline early Christian text, as though it's against Paul. But I don't think that's true. I think what we have in Matthew is an example of early Christian, early Jewish Christians 
trying to find a way of peace with this new movement that's beginning to include Gentiles. So in this movement of the early church from becoming from in this movement from being a Jewish sect interested only in a mission to the to the Jews it was growing out of that and becoming a more inclusive religion it was crossing cultural boundaries the threat against the opposition that Jesus encountered in Israel was history. <coughs> it doesn't mean that there weren't still a lot of burning issues. There were a lot of, a lot of um, issues that continued to be, uh, that continued to divide the early church but at least I think we're able to witness in Paul and in Matthew and in the life of Peter this process of stepping across um, the boundaries of what was considered at one time to be clean and unclean. They stepped across this. I don't know if, I'm, if I've made the point well enough for you guys to understand that I'm trying to suggest that we might, we might be privy here to some important information for us as we try to do the same thing in our world. How do you, how do you take what you consider to be spiritual truth and share it with people who are different than you? Do the differences between you um, provide a barrier? What do you do about those differences? What, when you step across, what do you let go of? What's cultural baggage? What is cultural baggage? Peter was caught in the middle of this struggle. If you read Galatians chapter 2, you'll find out that Peter was sort of like, yeah, I understand, Paul, what you're doing and what you are up to, but um, he didn't really know. Let, let me read it to you in Galatians chapter 2. It's kind of an interesting... I'll start reading in verse 3. I'll start reading in verse 2. And it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel, the, the um, leaders in Jerusalem, I submitted to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. We did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel right, might remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had to the circumcised. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed, re reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw. 
and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So there we've got Peter waffling. He was caught in the middle. But I think he ended up on a, a pretty certain foundation. Anyway, we have Paul dealing with this issue in Galatians 2, in the way that he confronted Peter, with just the subject of food, food that is clean or unclean, eating with Gentiles. <coughs> I think Paul understood very clearly that the cultural baggage had to be declared. He was trying to get the other leaders of the church to deal with this. Guys, what, what do you think is spiritual truth about the way that you worship and the things that you believe? What is spiritual truth and what about it is just cultural baggage that if you had to step into another world, you could let that go? What could you let go and what could you not let go? It's a critical question to ask. We see the church having to deal with it. The whole thing was started by Jesus. He started this. But that's the question I want to leave you with today. Because um, I think it's an important one for us to think about and answer. The Christian church in times past has made foolish mistakes when, when forced to answer this question. Because spiritual truth has nothing to do with the way you wear your hair, the clothes you wear, the food you eat, the language you speak, the place you worship. That's cultural baggage. Okay? What is spiritual truth? What can't you leave behind? This was the issue the early church had to deal with. I mean, it was in their face. Paul put it there, in their face. We can see, we can see it being dealt with in Matthew. And Luke and Mark. But here it's especially interesting because we have here a group of Jewish Christians who are still living in their Jewish world. That's Totally okay, guys. It's totally okay. <laughs> Believe me. My neighbors are Messianic Jews. I think I've told you. They go to synagogue on Sabbath. I have no problem with that. <coughs> they have more of a problem with me worshiping on Sunday than I have with them worshiping on Saturday. But... This is an interesting question, isn't it? What is spiritual truth? What, what can't be left behind if you step across a cultural boundary? Think about it. I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>